When I was hanging out with my friends, one of them suggested we could play D&D on our next hangout. The idea of playing a TTRPG instead of watching movies like usually did seem fun. However, I'm prejudiced against the game, even though I've never played it. I keep seeing complaints about D&D on Tumblr and I dislike the type of story D&D tries to tell. With the endless power escalation, adventurers being inherently superior kind of people to the dimwit villagers. On top of this, every time I tried to join a D&D group, it felt through one way or the other. So at first I joked I'll make a new system. Before our next meeting, I made a new system. So even though I've never played any TTRPG and only watched story times on YouTube, I still am the perfect person to work on this. I have godlike art skills and shitload of experience world building because of my webcomic and other side projects. So I, I did it. I, I made a TTRPG. I, I did it. I, I worked on this I, in just a week. Welcome to the corrupted lands, bitch. That's not, that's not part of the name. I started with a list of ideas of what the game should be like. Characters and their goals will be pulled from a random list of blank slate starters, and then they will change as the game progresses. It will include negative conditions, curses, wounds, loss of limbs and illness, as well as magical transformations and so on. The goal of the system is to have characters forged in battle, so there isn't any reality versus expectation clash later on from characters prepared before the game. Players will be generally disempowered. This will not be a power fantasy and generally combat should be the last resort. System should stress role-playing over mechanics, which probably backfired the most out of the list. The map is randomly generated, so there is less for me to prepare and more emergent, uh, interesting stuff going on. I kind of hope the story will be an emergent property of players and the setting being put into a blender, which I suppose was fairly optimistic. So, okay, let's get to mechanics. Let's get down to business. Let's fuckerino do it. The mechanics I'm going to explain will be from the first version. I'm not going to walk you through the exact process of how I got to it. Although I will mention mechanics I came up with on the spot uh, during the game and uh, reworks uh, and things I'm considering to change will not be in this part. This is saved for later. So over time, I figured the first mechanic I have to get down is travel. I can build things on top of it. So this will be the foundation on which the game is built upon. After the players draw their characters, goals and two random items, they start traveling on a grid system with moveset of a king in chess. And as they travel, they lose one stamina and food per travel, uh, per, per character also. Stamina can be replenished by staying in place and resting, which still costs one food for each player, while resting players gain one HP anywhere on their body. When players go to a new tile, they roll dice and depending on the outcome of the dice, they draw from a specific deck what they find. At the roll of one, players find a place which stays there permanently after being found. On roll of two, players draw a random loot card. On roll of three, there is a random encounter from the encounter deck. On rolls of four and five, there is nothing. And on rolls of six, they find uh, one foot for each character. And during a stop, when d6 is rolled, and on the rolls of 6, there is also an encounter, but during the night when they sleep. Sleep. Kurva. English. And when traveling through a tile that is already explored, the same rules apply as before, but you can't draw a place when you roll 1. Depending on the drawn place, players may interact with it in numerous ways. For instance, working, which is spending 1d6 stamina in exchange for 1d6 otnix, which is the name of the currency in the setting. They can buy from the free random items for 1d6 each, spend one otnik per player to regain stamina, and buy 1d6 food for 1d6 money as well, or any amount in the cities. The places would also contain whatever I just came up with on the spot. I had to limit earning money once per entering place, 
because it was pointed out to me that staying in place and just resting and working is GTA infinite money glitch. Just a clunky solution that is all I have right now. Sometimes during a conversation with an NPC, a place can be marked on the map too, which is a valuable tool for the dungeon mistress when players are running out of food or you just want to direct them. Whenever players go to another tile without food and or stamina, they flip a coin and depending on the result lose one sanity or discard one loot card. So at this point I'm of course keenly aware that this is more of a board game than a TTRPG even though it has role playing elements, but as a wise philosopher once said, rigid definitions are basically Margaret Thatcher. So let's get to the character stats, they work as follow. Sanity is a magic and a charm modifier. The higher it is, the better you are at talking to people with your roles, and the lower it is, the worse you are at talking to people, but better at spells. Um, at least in theory, because in practice there aren't that many spell roles, which is my fuck up. Another stat is carrying capacity. And I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, I guess it's like a temporary name. This stat explains how much loot your character can carry, and it isn't affected by food because everyone in the setting has a contract with the food spirits who will carry up to 13 of it for you, which is an elegant solution. Agility is the stat that adds or deduces from roles requiring it, which is uh, mostly based on the vibes right now, except for dodging, which can be just done with it in the current form. Stamina is the resources for actions and traveling, and because of that overlapped, I hoped uh, players will be more strategic with resting, since if they enter combat, they might not be able to use a spell. Defense, uh, the attack roll needs to hit higher than the defense value of the attacked unit, uh, otherwise it doesn't hit. An HP is separated into head, core, arms and legs, and while having arms and legs at full HP, head and torso have plus one defense for each. And characters have also the base damage stat, which is applied when you roll above opponent's defense without any spell. So as you might see here, for a game without combat focus, most of the stats here, in fact, focus on combat. This is my failure. I thought everything else would be something you can roleplay through and not requiring stats or numbers. The lack of options to interact with things beyond combat will be a major issue and something I'll get criticized for. When an encounter card is drawn, it is usually something to roleplay through or occasionally a random animal attack to escape from. The escaping player have two options, roll 1d6 with their agility modifier applied to escape or go backwards, diagonally, or to the tile they come from at the cost of one foot per player. Right now only one player needs to succeed at the escape roll so there is an option of guarding, which allows player to block damage if the roll is higher than it. This is only in retrospect very generous, but more on how that played out later. If combat is entered, initiative is decided by a coin flip. You can do a basic attack or use an item, but some of them don't take a turn, but it isn't super clear which ones do and which ones don't. The ones that affect your roll wouldn't and the ones that deal damage would, but there are ones where it isn't as clear. The turns of players resolve simultaneously and so do the turns of opponents. When an HP value of arms or legs reaches 0, players roll 1d6 and if they roll 1, they have permanent damage or loss of 1 limb. Their HP in that area becomes 1, and they have minus 2 to agility and on loss of an arm they have minus 4 carrying capacity and minus 1 damage. If they don't roll 1, they get same penalty but it isn't permanent. Additionally, when players travel with any damage whatsoever, their max stamina and agility are lowered by 1, carrying capacity by 2, and they lose 1 sanity. This is based on my experience traveling damage. Rolling 1 after a head or torso reaches 0 HP is death. And here are most of the loot cards I've designed for the test run. You might notice lots of parallels to a famous Japanese anime, The Pining of Isaac Four Souls, and it was a major inspiration for the combat system. Some items work similarly to the pills in that game, some give just some stat boosts, and there are permanent courses changing your character to see how that would work. After making all of these items, I also added some generic coins and food governing stuff into the loot pile, because I was worried players wouldn't get enough food and money to actually function within this world and they would just die from starvation. And those are all of the mechanics. Now I'm going to read out the general background lore, religion and encounters, after which 
we'll explore how their test run went. The lore is a bit derivative, just like the gameplay, partially because that the cult of originality, Satul, liberals invented to sell us immaterial stuff like ideas, later down the line, NFTs. Creating things is more about mixing ingredients together to create a dish. And baby, I was fucking cooking. So I started working from the idea of Russian smuta, which is something I learned from a Warlocracy video. Basically, once in Russia, a Tsar has died without a successor and things got so bad without a ruler that the nobles decided to import a Polish one, a dude with different faith, and this started even worse times. You know, by an Eastern European standard. <laughs> Enter the corrupted lands. The queen of the Pokutan Empire has died without a successor during an otherworldly surge of energy. The empire falls into chaos. Multiple child cities declare independence in liberal revolutions as anarchist uprisings within the borders supported by the chaos gods grow in scale enough to threaten the continuity of the empire. The nobles try multiple things to save it, for instance, supporting various distant successors or creating an electoral monarchy system, which would allow them to gain even more power. Eventually, they split into two major factions, one trying to install a leader from another country, follower of Laonism with a different denomination than them. They call themselves the Arm of Restoration, the ones who want literally anything else, the White Army. While all this shit is going down, the main body of the anarchist faction, the Flowers of Evil, takes the current Laonic Messiah, sent by their god to spread his order, and they remove his manhood with a chaos shard, which is unwinding the way their god made the reality work, but more on their religion later. And now, there is a four-faction civil war between the Arm of Restoration, the White Army, the Free Cities, and the Flowers of Evil. Let's get into what exactly Laonism is about, so the history above makes more sense. The official doctrine of the Laonic Church, when the world was young and the wild gods still changed it on a whim, before the titans were all killed in the war, the sentient races worshipped many such beings and their own ancestors. Laon has written light into existence and gave it to them. He showed them the ways of order and civilization. When the evil god Shal Nazul has declared his civilization superior and Laon a danger to other gods, he created a force of shadows and titans that would follow him into fighting Lion. Many gods sided with his light, and so did the ancestors of sentient races. But women were tempted by the promises of Shell, of being risen above men in the hierarchy, and sided with him. Laon won and casted his adversary into the void, where he waits to return for another final battle. Until then, the influence of Laon and his order has to spread, to bring light to the people, so now they are ruled by the, his traditions, his light and his social roles. To achieve this, Laon regularly spawns a son, to spread the message through war. This is called the messianic cycle. Every two centuries, a new son of Laon is born. He is raised by the clergy, spreads teaching by military conquest, usually isn't kidnapped by Caius gods and their followers, then he performs the ritual that brings the world closer to the Laonic vision, changing its laws and then becoming a minor god. Because of the system of belief, women are treated as lower class in a different way than post-Victorian sexism we deal with today. They are servants and inherently morally dubious, can only follow men into the light, either through marriage or becoming a nun, and can find the light themselves. They are not treated as frail baby incubators. They have the original sin. However, proximity to evil is still related to your class, so a woman can be a queen, because at this point she is very close to God. Noble women too are higher than peasants. Peasant women are basically the devil. Men can marry each other because they are inherently connected to the light, but women can't. As far as transness goes, trans men can gain a higher position than a woman, they'll be treated and called like a half-man. And while their vision of masculinity and femininity are very different than ours, which makes many men faggy and effeminate by our current standard. Transitioning into a woman is basically falling outside of the light. There are no non-binary genders within the culture aside from that, even though such people obviously still exist. Also, the alchemy in this world is seen as inherently dirty. Only women can use guns, because they are worse anyway. There are two denominations of Laonism, and the Messiah never says which one is better for some reason. Simply excuse later, maybe it's a recent thing before Messiah returned, Maybe he doesn't know the answer because he's just a kid, that's for later. 
In second governing under Nero's, the church was split into two factions, Malinus and Cherbiaki. Malinus, the one important king is following, after the Reformation, according to them, women can be saved just by their works and faith, and marriage isn't necessary, leaders are only appointed by God but aren't divine by themselves, Shalnazul can possibly win if the order isn't spread enough according to them, and Malin, the reforming priest, was divinely inspired. Alcohol is only allowed on weekends, but it doesn't mention other substances so far. In Cherbiaki, the official Bokutan religion, women can only be saved by marriage or becoming a nun. Leaders aren't just chosen by God, but have divine light in them. Shalnazul can't win, and the divinity of words from the highest kapan cannot be questioned, and Malin was a little bitch. So, I have designed this entire alternative universe sexism, which, I mean, works pretty closely to a Roman Empire sexism, but still. For what reason exactly? Honestly, not sure. Not including such issues feels ingenuine to my sensibilities. Like, if gender exists, then setting should consider how it all fits, without just copy-pasting modern roles. I still wanted women to be in the army and butch, I just made a system where they can be in the higher positions. Obviously, Launig version of the history is meant to be biased towards their god, but with critical thinking you can probably figure what is an omission or lie serving solidifying of his power. The Chaos Gods are a variety of wild divinities and other entities that have vision of the world not aligning with Lion and each other, and have tenuous alliance that is meant to bring him down, creating a new age from which they all will try to force their own plans of reality onto it. Some of them are even worse and more oppressive than the Launix, and others want to create a constantly shifting world of freedom, so obviously their offers are tempting for every minority persecuted by their opponents. Okay, and from that let's get into the character bases I prepared for the test run. Base characters needed to be a balance of generic enough fantasy beings that will give player a wiggle room for creating their own story, and being strange enough to give that hook to start working with them. I managed to watercolor four of them before our first game to test some mechanics. Forest Diablo was meant to be more or less an easy mode. It gains more food and loot, has good carrying capacity, but is even worse at fighting than most of these characters because of sanity loss from entering combat, and low damage. Ability to draw a loot card for two stamina is another possibility of GTA Infinite Money Glitch. I suppose this one is at least reduced by the carrying capacity. The second character is the Wanderer. They were not supposed to be defined by their atrocious combat capabilities, so I had to think of spells that interact with other mechanics. The Wanderer starts with an ability to mark a spot at the cost of stamina, and return everyone who was there with them for the cost of even more stamina. This was meant to be a strategic ability that would make stamina management important. Scrat Mystic has the ability to change an ally stat by plus one for an encounter, another attempt at a spell that doesn't just deal damage, but it also isn't affected by sanity modifier, even though the character starts with low sanity to be a spellcaster. Aside from that, it also loses an item when taking damage and gains one HP on one use items, another generic ability to playtest. The doll has the most text out of the starters, but majority of it is just to make her function as a non-biological character, so she can't be healed without specialists, animals ignore her unless feel threatened, resistance to things that wouldn't affect a construct, no sanity penalty from traveling damaged, more health than most at the beginning, an ability to have charm rolls not affected by sanity, very flavor first designs, possibly the worst character, but it is hard to say, ain't no one played her. In the encounter book, I've put some creatures first, then social groups possible to meet, eventually I'm planning to try to force myself to put characters in this too. Characters will be very one use, and wouldn't most players and DMs want to create their own little designs to populate the world? Of course, Putting example characters to show possibilities to potential players, as if anyone else will play it, can work. Alternatively, this could have more visual novel or other video game-esque appeal, where player changes and character butterfly effect from that. Well, here are the encounters. Starting off with a beetle wolf, a generic monster that is invasive to the area and the ecosystem, so killing them doesn't feel as bad, but is still a sin. They were imported long ago by the emperor that thought they were cool. They usually hunt in pairs and deal additional damage to targets they damaged before, and also are easier to damage when they are damaged themselves. Second design with more possibility for roleplay is the pseudolich. Players can find a hat on their travel, and if they put it on, its crustacean legs jumps off and they take control over you. 
Alternatively, they may offer you a deal to put them on someone important in return for staff, or they can be already in control of someone, having access to more spells and better positions. The idea is that long ago there was a fashion for mages to put their soul inside of their hats, in a trick, to be able to control another body by being put on. But it became so popular that the trick is now completely worn out and they are just pests now. This fight is meant to be very winnable, especially when no one puts it on. Pseudo liches are also the only time delirium is implemented as a mechanic, so I didn't mention it before. If players' sanity reaches zero, they are delirious. What does that mean? Literally nothing. Aside from the fact that pseudo liches can knock you out instantly in their base form. Grasps are just kind of mindless brutes. They are arms of titans that Laon and his army have killed, and now they protect imaginary borders between countries much younger than them. Maraquirm or Mood Dragon or Mood Worm or Giant Salamander is an ambush predator, like Crocodile but Amphibian. They are inspired by that one amphibian from Walking with Dinosaurs, and they were a friend's suggestion. Overall, they are just pretty realistic, mildly pozonous ambush predator, not much to say here. Then we get to the Alex, the Pond Spirits. They come into the existence from Chaos Magic, touching a body of water. They don't fear death and lower resistance to alcohol of those who consume them, so they are hunted to be used in drinks. They are also designed for the roleplay potential. Of more friendly category, they can heal players, change their sanity a little, how their target wants. They can't fight back, wouldn't if they could, and they can teach spells maybe? Like in our game, I allowed players to learn them for the stamina cost of the spell proper, but I don't know if that's how it should work. The next one is the first type of soldier that can be found. The Hrust. They are low-ranked, barely trained peasants, as weapons they use axes and guns, and they have minor loaning blessings on them, since they also need to stay pure despite using alchemical weapons or being human. They can lower your defense with holy magic or kill you with a gun. Low-ranking grants, there is a role-playing possibility with the ritual obtaining these blessings. And the next up is the Militia, which are even worse grants. They lose sanity when they are damaged and have a chance of running away when sanity reaches 6 and they fail a coin flip. Maybe I should have used straightened sights for the art, which would make it more like a historical Poland, but I don't know. And after that we have the noblemen. Since the entire premise of the setting is that they do not live in the electoral monarchy, this creates a dissonance between the Russian and Polak inspo. In the end, they have all the privilege before the crown the Polish nobles had, including parliamentary power, but can vote on the crown, which is weird to put isn't contradictory enough to bother me right now. Some nobles have saint ancestors, since they could have served under the previous messiahs, but for the most part this is the next step of the knight class. They have judiciary power in villages they manage, can be held accountable without a trial, they often own small armies and are also obligated to carry weapons and so do their wives. These are all the creatures I managed to prepare in a week. Not enough uh, Chaos God stuff, but that's for later, I suppose. The idea was that before the game, I make a list of encounters for this session and place them in a deck to pull from randomly. This would eventually result in a story. As Stephen King once said after seeing Egyptian God Tov in his dream under Stalingrad, story is when the random shit happens and the more random it is, the more story will it end up being. Guided by his grotesque wisdom, I've embarked on my journey to playtest this shit. Finding people to play test it with wasn't difficult, many wanted to. The struggle was finding two of them free on one day. But I did it, as I am blessed and divine being. So with the date set, they rolled their characters and goals, I explained the setting and some systems, and we started. It quickly turned out that the idea of creating a character on the spot based on what I detailed was quite stressful, which is the first strain on the system. They drew a wanderer and a mystic shot, and we started playing. The game became a series of barely connected vignettes. Players would escape from beetle wolves without an issue, find an Alec carried out of its pond by a storm, then come across a pseudo while holding the Alec. First player was tempted into wearing it, then the second heard the Alec say, you know, I don't think an Alec ever died to a pseudo and smack the hat out of her hand, and then they would beat it to death, and bring the pond spirit home. Then they escorted some random merchants for cash and were chased away from a guard outpost while being out of stamina. It was pretty chaotic and it didn't have any through line, but players did have a good time in the moment, lots of lads laughs were had. It's kind of like playing secondary or tertiary characters in a bigger story. Well, like they were playing because I was the dungeon mistress. Like you, Rosencrantz and Gildester into Hamlet or Timon and Pumba or other Mary and Pippin. But Bakshi's version, not, not, not uh, the Peter Jackson, the, the good one. 
I said this a lot now to friends, so it is going to be be a little tiring. But tonight it this did feel a lot like Ralph Bakshi's uh, cinematography, especially the fantasy movies. Because of this lack of true line or traditional narrative structure, like in D&D, you could say it's a postmodern TTRPG. We will now get into the criticism section, where my good friend Lyman will read out a criticism of another friend who actually played the game. This will mainly be focusing on the experience of play. The lore is widely detailed for something you made within a week. Real schizo shit, but nothing but praise for that. I feel like the general outline that you have here is quite nice. The idea of drawing a pre-made goal can be quite a nice guide for players that are not familiar with the system. Everyone except maybe you at this point. I like the portraits and the character sheets that you made. For giving a little bit of detail of somebody's playing, something like a session solely for character creation or back and forth between you and a player before the initial session might be smart. I feel like coming up with ideas in the moment can be limiting. You want the ability to ask clarifying questions about the world and your character's place in it to maximize role-playing potential. The things we did with the characters feel less like characters. They had no real tie to the world except for living in it. No family, no history, no ties to the world other than a goal. No clear path in mind to realize it since the players don't know about the world. I think having the roll the dice to see what you tile you stepped on is a little bit flawed. I understand why you want to do it like that, but I feel like in its current form it provides a few issues. NPCs cannot be familiar with the lands. They can react and post hoc justify what's there, but they cannot be like, Ayo, hey, there's some bug wolves around that area recently. This is what makes the world feel less lived in. You cannot say this caravan's going along like old roads, no need to worry, since you can roll the dice and suddenly draw Dark Souls Poison Swamplands, and that's what you have to trek through. You cannot gather information around the makeup of the land beforehand, preparing for excursions essentially consists of making sure that you have enough food, and perhaps items, and then hoping for the best. This could be addressed potentially by laying out general locations beforehand and having something like play stacks that are specific to the type of stuff that would be in that type of area for filling out the spaces in between. You can have, I don't know, Specific areas for forest lands, for like bug wolf encounters, pseudo liches, custom item piles, maybe not mountain dwelling species, maybe no cave dwellers. Food and stamina serve as resources to track when exploring. I think they're somewhat redundant and could be simplified. Currently, you use both one stamina and one food for movement. You can also use one food to rest for the night, restoring your stamina. Stamina is used as a resource for combat and works within cities. I think it would make more sense to have food be reserved as a resource used for resting rather than something you use in addition to stamina for movement. It's one more thing to keep track of for the questionable gameplay function. Spending stamina when traveling is a trade-off. You will have to make sure that you don't run out in case you run into combat. Food doesn't have that interesting interaction. It's a resource you're forced to spend for movement. There's nothing to do there but try to keep enough of it around to survive if it's used for movement too. If it was a resource used for resting alone, something you'd presume to do only once or twice a day within the logic of the game, there would be more of a thrill in deciding if it's worth to use your food now to restore stamina or to conserve it and travel further, trying to make it further before restocking. I think adding pre-planned cities would be good. Cities felt more like shops and forcing you to make up stuff, forcing any couple of stuff with on the spot. I think you should consider adding more stats that can be applied for allowing more role-playing. Stuff like historical knowledge, sensitivity to magic, stuff that gives you a framework for role-play. You currently have abilities to deal with encounters listed on the encounter sheet, but it feels very rigid. It would be very nice to have options arise from the players rather than just pre-made options, emergent gameplay and all that. I feel like at the moment there are kind of rigid restrictions on how to deal with situations. You can charm, maybe intimidate, or fight while talking, but you have no other options of dealing with that stuff. You can't say, I can lie real good, or I can use magic over here to distract him. I'm adept with nature, therefore I'm able to identify this plan, etc, etc. I feel like there's room to grow for the ability to interact with the world and the characters and etc. That is the criticism. Once again, thanks to Lyman for reading it and to my friend for writing it. One rework that I could see I could do is making the DM play the deck not randomly, but deliberately. The dice decides whether the DM plays the place or an encounter, but DM chooses from the encounter or place pile what to put there. This has some potential, but I like the randomness though. Escaping from the combat isn't punishing enough to create a meaningful decision right now. Going pack a tile for the cost of one foot per character isn't a big deal. Maybe it should be based on agility and running away would require to lose some loot. This could be random to requiring dice roll or something, even though running away should be the right decision most of the time. It shouldn't be this easy. I think combat is bad right now, but it wasn't playtested, so I don't know what to do with it. Overall, I'm also just not sure how much potential this system with the setting has. 
If the end user tells one story of endlessly escalating states, the Tetris create a system that tells the story of your characters being some losers getting lost in Eastern Europe. I'm not sure how many problems of this system can be solved just by creating more content by volume and how much I actually need to rework. Perhaps the most optimal solution will be to just pick up a different TTRPG and create my own content for it. Instead of creating my own, like I'm not great at working on such skeletons of gameplay and mechanics, I'm better at meat of lore and arting. I don't know if I like this lore even though. It has some nuggets I like, but overall it's, it, I, I don't super like it. Yeah, this is the end of the video. I don't know. I don't know. This has future, 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 future uh, see you losers.